Hi mom, sorry for not sending you a message for so long, but things have been a bit hectic lately. We mostly spend our time on the road, so finding some time to record a full message and then finding a spot to send it from wasn't really an option. But we're on a little break in Port Prosperity now, so here it goes. First, I still can't believe just how fast this town grows. We were here three months ago, and since then the administration added two new districts, and not just old prefab habitats most of us have been using since landing, but actual constructed buildings. We even have some high-rise towers now for the wealthy investors who moved in to speed up development. The town, or, well, city, grows so fast that you can't even see the colony ship anymore, except the main comm tower. Hard to believe that just two years ago we thought this ship was all we needed. Anyway, by now most of the city moved outside of Prosperity and into the buildings. The ship has now been mostly repurposed as a centre for administration and as main power plant. Hence, of course, we have tunnels. Hundreds of kilometres of tunnels already carved into this world to hide our people from the open sky, which is quite prominent here on Curaçao, since we have far less mountains than back home. Maybe in time we'll learn how to live in regular cities like our ancestors, but for now most of the settlers gravitate towards familiarity of the caves. After all, it's safe and warm there, and mushroom farms and factories where most people walk are never far away. Though it's mostly warmth that draws people in. We thought Ortis was a cold place, but damn Curaçao is even chillier. Most of the planet is covered in glaciers, and it's going to be one hell of a job to carve some useful land for ourselves. But the survey is already on the case, with our help, of course. Speaking of which, we still have the same job as before. We're still rangers. Since not many people are willing to travel the frozen steps, people like me and my brother are in high demand, especially since we now have hundreds of other settlements across the planet, not just Port Prosperity. I mean, seriously, the immigration rate is so high that administration claims we're about to hit a population of 1 billion in time for 5th touchdown anniversary. It's getting crowded in the capital, so people are starting to move to these smaller towns scattered around, and that's where we come in, ferrying people and resources to our outlying towns. Most of these places are just small research outposts, but we're starting to see some real towns out there, mostly next to geothermal vents or easily accessible natural resources. But not everything's shiny here. This place is pretty much out of the way of any form of justice system, so it draws some unpleasant people in. For every ten settlements, we get one that's full of people who try to get around the law. Mostly they use Curaçao as a safe spot for drug factories, but we also have some more regular bandits who came here to raid settlements and until recently we had little in terms of law enforcement around here, just a few hundred marshals scattered all across the planet. But recently the administration decided they want to clean up a bit, so things have changed. Which is why I wasn't able to send you anything for a while, because, as I mentioned, we mostly spent time in the wilds acting as scouts and guides for the marshals. They got a boost to their numbers recently and a new bossman. I thought he'll be some stiff council guy, but he turned out surprisingly okay. Used to be a security chief on that Tesla ship, but he's real down to earth guy, goes with his men on the missions and realizes we have to walk with limited facilities here, so he figured out something he calls the process. You'd like that. Remember that time when Pavel and I accidentally messed up that hydroponic garden next to town? You gave us the worst ass whooping of our lives back then, but never ratted us out to the police. This guy works in similar way. He realizes that sending a guy back to Ortus for a sentence in mines would be pointless, not to mention expensive as hell. So when we find some bad guys, like a bunch of Kithri eaters we rounded up last week, we apply the process. First, there's a lecture. We explain to the offenders, in great detail, that the Kithri are on the same level of intelligence as a half-year-old toddler. Then, we explain just what exactly the justice system will do to the offender on orders for murdering and eating a half-year-old toddler. And finally, we apply the violence, in amounts equivalent to the crime. In this particular case, that means both arms broken in three or four places and being transported to the nearest martial-controlled settlement to walk out debts to the society. You don't really need walking arms to take care of mushroom farms anyway. Swift, efficient and visible enough to deter almost everyone except the most stupid or desperate. With a bit of luck and some additional support from home, we should be able to clear Curaçao of the worst dens of villainy before the official inauguration. So, lots of work ahead of us, but at least it pays far better than regular old cave dwelling. Not to mention we actually get to do some good here. Can you believe it, Mum? Your boys are helping with colonization efforts. Anyway, we're moving out again, so I'll have to wrap this up. I'll send you my half of the salary with the next transport, same as always, but with this job soon we'll be able to afford a nice home here, and you could finally join us. Despite all I said, it's really a nice place, full of promise. And I know that over the years we'll make it even better.
Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to episode 4 of Second Chance. Last time we followed a six year mission of Commander Shen Kuo and his intrepid team of explorers, but as our attention was focused on them, great many things have happened in the background, the most important of which was, of course, creation of our first extrasolar colony on planet Kurosao, as well as encountering a pre-sentient species there. Unfortunately, in our enthusiastic drive into the great unknown, our government failed to realize that managing an interstellar nation is surprisingly expensive, especially in the early days when the colonies don't really contribute anything to overall economy. Because of that, we now find ourselves in the middle of a serious financial crisis, our treasury is running dangerously low, and by now we risk a complete collapse of our government, even before the colony on Kurosawa could bring us any profits. So right now, all projects will have to be delayed, and every single citizen of OCN will have to focus their attention on trying to fix this mess before we collapse under our own weight. And there are several things we can do about it. First and foremost, we can change the production production focus back on orders. Thanks to our policy of stockpiling food, we now have a pretty decent reserve, so instead we could switch to growing various cash crops. Alternatively, we can provide our farmers with various incentives and convince them to move into one of our major cities. They won't be able to produce as much crops there, though they still will be able to grow some, thanks to our green cities policy, but most importantly, we could use those people to work in various financial and administrative jobs and increase our overall income. And that's what we're going to do, because right now, aside from maintaining Curacao, our edicts and administration are the greatest drain on our treasury. Granted, moving all those people from their farms to urban centers won't really solve our problem, not by a long shot, as we'll still be in the red, but at the very least we'll be able to delay the looming threat of a bankrupt state for a while longer, which might just be enough for the rest of our nation to find a solution. Second thing we could do would probably take slightly more time, but it has a higher chance of a long-term success. We could try to do something that's long overdue, and reform our economy. Right now, Professor Tanwan and her team will have to abandon their various xenobiological pursuits, and instead will have to focus on figuring out just what exactly we need to keep the nation that spans several planets from falling apart. There is, however, an issue, one that we clearly had not expected. With our first colony on a different world, Otis has lost millions of people, who decided that, instead of continuing their jobs, they would rather be pioneers. And among those people, there were, inevitably, tens of thousands of various researchers, who left for the new world hoping to find something of interest out there. And while this is an admirable goal, it also means that we no longer have access to those people, and even if we still are in contact with them, the communication delays will make any sort of cooperative research far more difficult, and as such we now suffer a 50% penalty to all our scientific endeavors. And finally, we have one more project in the works out there, one that we won't put on hold no matter what, as it just might be our last saving grace during this crisis. I'm talking of course about our science ships. Plural, because now we have two of them. CSV Tesla, with its veteran crew of space explorers led by Commander Shen Kuo, and CSV Outlier, a relatively new vessel currently under a watchful eye of Commander Melanie Giraud. Ms. Giraud and her team actually have quite a large number of missions under their belts already, but unfortunately said missions were nowhere as spectacular as the ones as Tesla embarked on. Still, if anything, Outlier's peaceful exploration, while less flashy, proved to be slightly more pragmatic, and the crew of our second ship found out several spots that could, in the future, be very beneficial to our industry. But now, as they finished exploration of the Helam system, Outlier's crew will have a chance to shine. There is another system, very close to Asha, called Redamon, that, according to our long-range scans, houses not one, but two habitable planets. One of them is, once again, very similar to Ortus, and by now I think we can all agree that we we are either extremely lucky or something is seriously out of place here, as is countering four similar habitable planets in such small areas simply shouldn't be possible. The other world, on the other hand, is a mesa planet, a hot, dry, mountainous rock with very little water, mostly concentrated in lakes and rivers at the bottom of great canyons. Now, although hot environment is something we're not used to, the very low humidity might be our saving grace there, since the biosphere shouldn't be too extensive. Actually, with a bit of work, this world might actually prove to be very important to our future endeavors, because it's the only planet we've encountered so far that has surface water that isn't constantly frozen. Back on Ortus and Curacao, we have to either thaw the ice or rely on underground rivers, which can be extremely dangerous, and since water is the most important element we need to live, having an easy access to it might just be what we need during our expansion. 
Also, there was another option to solve our financial crisis that was presented to our government. Instead of colonizing planets, which is very expensive, we could build an outpost in one of the outlying systems, Zorf in this case, and use it as a sort of free port our people could travel to and basically do whatever they want, provided they would pay us a share. In theory, a decent idea, since it would certainly increase our sphere of influence, but in the end the Frontier Outpost project turned out to be pointless at this point. It would simply require too much of an upfront investment, which is something we can't afford right now. But still, it's an option we have to keep in our minds, as it might be useful in the future. And finally, there was another development, somewhat related to the crisis. Some time ago, Professor Lachinov has established a survey corps, and managed to convince several influential investors to back it up, and the results came almost immediately. The core was sent to do a detailed analysis of all planets in Asha system, and soon they established a base of operation on the moon Rhea, which, to the surprise of almost everyone involved, they deemed to be habitable. Barely, but habitable. It would be extremely difficult to build and maintain a colony there, but at the very least it's good to know we have an option like that. It's unlikely that we'll do anything about it, but it's good nonetheless. So, as the year 2209 slowly came to a close, the universe itself decided to give us a little fireworks display, in celebration of our first decade spent in space, and it did so in the form of a spectacular comet that passed through the atmosphere of Ortus. Our ancestors probably would have been terrified by it, both in ancient times, since they believed that comets were a bad omen, the superstitious fools, and the ones from the Exodus, since their Earth has been destroyed by a space rock similar to the one that passed above our heads, but to our current citizens, this sight was uplifting. It reminded us that now, like this stellar traveller, we were no longer confined to a single world, and so for a few days our people held their heads slightly higher. No matter the danger, they thought we can overcome it. If that asteroid would try to destroy us, Admiral Lin and her ships would simply blow it to hell. We have learned our lessons, and we will not lose our home ever again. And so, with the passing of that comet still in the heads of our population, we have come to yet another step in our journey. The 10-year term of Innovation Party is now over, and it's time for yet another elections that will decide who will lead humanity for the next 10 years. So, let us take a look at the candidates, because they're quite an interesting bunch. First, we have, surprisingly, Commander Shen Kuo himself. His dangerous encounters in outer space have changed him a bit, and he's no longer that cheerful young troublemaker he was at university. Instead, he became warlike, eager to solve humanity's problems with a smoking gun. No wonder, since of all our people, he has seen the worst the universe had to offer. He's also, another surprise, well-connected, and has access to many influential people in Ocean government. And finally, he amassed quite a fortune during his travels. We won't question how, exactly, but it would allow him to invest in our development, something we could use right now. Next, we have current Chancellor, Drahoslav Teza, and he's still the same science-oriented reformer and hobbyist farmer, but he's also deeply embroiled in in various projects of Professor Tanwa's Biosoc division, and, of course, he already has quite a lot of experience in leading the Council. Third on the list is Professor Adhira Tanwa herself, focused on scientific progress and agriculture, just like our Chancellor. She complements her spark of genius with surprising charisma, which she could use to push our administration to work slightly more efficiently. And finally, we have Professor Nestor Lachinov. It seems our science people are really enjoying playing politics. Though he was initially opposed to early colonization efforts, a stream of good news from Curaçao have changed his outlook on things, and now he's a fierce proponent of interstellar expansion. He's also a very organized person, and his ideas could increase the efficiency of our bureaucrats. And just like Commander Kuo, he is a wealthy man, thanks to all the machines he invented. The power exoskeletons alone have probably made him one of the richer people in our country. Still, he is willing to invest that money, so no one will complain. So, an interesting lineup here. Not a single one of those candidates is from Exile Party, so it seems the innovators are really popular right now. But as you have seen, the government has quietly used all the influence it has amassed over the years to make sure that it would be Mr. Tessa, who will become Chancellor once again. Now, some people might be disappointed, but in the end Tessa is the most reasonable choice. Sure, other candidates could do much good as heads of the state, but as it stands they are far more useful where they are now, not in the politics. Electing Kuo would mean losing an experienced explorer, and today we need explorers more than we need politicians, and losing Tanwar or Lachinov would completely destabilize our science council. So, for now we'll officially support Tessa, and we'll have to see what people say. 
And actually, the people have quite a lot to say. With everything that's happened during this past decade, our population has painted a picture of itself. And in this picture, they are explorers, the discoverers, the intrepid pioneers who boldly go to explore the verse. And today, with the news of elections mixing up with official statement from Latinov's Planetary Survey Corps, a statement that says they are now hiring, that excitement our people have shown from day one has erupted into something far more measurable. Among the celebrations of 10th anniversary of the Expanse project, thousands of new ideas pop up at every step, as citizens of OCN are eagerly trying to contribute to the situation they now find themselves in. A situation that, just a decade ago, would have been considered impossible, or at least overly optimistic. And the ideas of our people are good, surprisingly good even, so good that it's going to be difficult to focus on just one of them. Some believe that we should focus on improving our military. Others claim that rushing for the colonies is the best thing they could do right now. And there are dozens of various governmental reforms, all coming from the brains of our society. But the thing is that, at this point in time, the general population is so excited with the possibilities that we just have to choose one of these options and they will follow it, without complaining that others were ignored. It's a hard choice, there's no doubt about that, since, as I mentioned, all those ideas are good, but in the end the decision of OCN was a relatively safe one. On the second day of year 2210, the Council has proclaimed an act of technological ascendancy, a document that states that humanity's main goal is to learn, and to use everything we've learned to push the boundaries of science further and further, until one day, things that once seemed like magic would be catalogued and understood. And then, we will repeat the process until the universe can no longer have hide any secrets from us. It was our intelligence and our ingenuity that took us to the stars, so now let us use the same qualities to turn them into our home. But we're still not done. With a new year came new inventions. In this case, reactors that used nuclear fusion to generate far more energy than our old fission generators. This invention has an absolute ton of applications, but the most prominent one is to simply use those generators to increase the energy output of our warships, as a nice new year gift for Admiral Lin and her people. And as you can see, her fleet has grown since the last time we saw it, and now contains six heavily shielded Akula-class corvettes, armed to the teeth with laser beams. Those corvettes are seen CSV Spitfire, the first one we built, and then CSV Kolovrat, Aurelian, Magdak, Nordica, and Gemini, all names chosen by citizens of our nation. In fact, if Admiral Lin is to be believed, her mailbox is constantly bombarded with names for potential future ships, something she finds admirable because it means that our people are interested in the fleet, which makes her job as a recruiter that much easier. So, the election campaigns came and went, but now, just a few days before the voting day, we had another surprise on our political scene. It seems that a number of our labour-minded citizens decided to organise themselves into a political faction called Industrious Council. But to make their sudden appearance even more interesting, it turns out that the face of this faction is none other than our own physics and computer expert, Dr. Roman Poniewski. And this means that, right now, the entirety of our science council is, in one way or another, embroiled in our internal politics which I actually am conflicted about. At one hand, it might be detrimental to our research efforts, since our chief researchers might get distracted from their jobs by politicking, but on the other hand, I'm really happy that our citizens choose to rally not behind ideologists, but behind pragmatists, who produce actual, measurable results. At any rate, the Industrious Council, we do love our councils here on Autos, is a relatively regular Labour Party. They want to take care of the little people, to make sure everyone has access to education, that everyone can move around as they wish, and, of course, if the government isn't abusing its rights by turning citizens into slaves, wage slavery included. Currently, the IC is quite happy with our governance, and that translates to a nice influence boost, since their most influential members openly support our policies. And I think that we can safely assume that, for a a good long while at least, things are not going to change, so the Industrious Council should become a nice backbone for our internal politics. But the appearance of this new party doesn't change the fact that the election day is about to happen. And, as you can see, everything went pretty much as expected. The people once again chose to elect Drahoslav Tezar as our Chancellor, making him our very first head of OCN that was elected more than twice. Remember, the Innovation Party is in power since 2190. Interestingly, some of his opponents claim that he hasn't really fulfilled his last mandate, but considering the changes that happened to our society over Tezar's last term, I honestly don't think anyone will care about that. 
that. Still, during the campaign, our old new chancellor rather vocally promised to create new workplaces for less scientifically minded citizens in outer space, and that means we'll have to build several mining stations out there, but fortunately that's exactly what we're planning to do, as soon as we find something of value out there. And also, you might have noticed there, our Chancellor has slightly changed focus of his personal affairs, and now he's mostly supporting Lachinov's Applied Sciences Division. Not sure why he changed his focus, but perhaps the rumours that his personal hobbies were surprisingly similar to Professor Tanwa's field of study had some truth in them. Regardless, with the elections out of the way now, we can once again focus on dealing with our financial crisis, while in the background Professor Adhira Tanwa will work on something pretty amazing. Ladies and gentlemen of OCN, allow me to, in the name of Sinon Financial Solutions, welcome you to the first interstellar financial panel. As you are all well aware, we are currently in the middle of an economic crisis, a crisis that we are all trying to contain as we speak, since our government seems to be unable or unwilling to take matters in their own hands. Now, despite that, the purpose of this panel is not to bash our politicians, something that previous speakers clearly forgot, but to find a solution to our problem. Because let me assure you, this is a problem that affects all of us, not just the OCN. Most of us have invested considerable amounts of money into various exploration and expansion efforts, and despite current situation, the SFS still believes that our investment will be worthwhile, unless the state collapses, that is. So, we are here to offer a solution, but before we can present it, we should first focus on the underlying cause of problems, our economy. When our ancestors came into this world, they brought with them a myriad of their currencies, all having a different value back on Earth. For instance, Commonwealth Zwote or Turkish Lira were worth more than Chinese Yuan or Indian Rupee. That has caused all manner of chaos in early days after the Exodus, but eventually all our ancestors, regardless of the currency they used, encountered the very same problem, that can easily be summarized with a simple question. What value does a coin have to a starving man when there is no food to be bought? The answer, of course, is none. And that situation made our ancestors realize that all their currencies are, inherently, completely worthless. For the coin is nothing more but a piece of metal, and a banknote is a simply piece of paper with a picture on it. They only possess value because everyone agrees they do, and once that agreement is out of the window, even the wealthiest man can suddenly become as poor as the lowliest beggar. And even even if the value remains, it's constantly under threat of speculations and fluctuations, which are factors that rarely follow any sort of reason or logic. As such, with the value of old Earth's currencies spiraling out of control, many of early Ortus societies reverted to barter system, which, while certainly useful in the early pioneering days of colonization, comes with dozens of its own problems. The most obvious one is ethics. A person with access to limited resource can inflate its price to an overwhelming amount, and use leverage gained in this way to commit questionable actions. On the other hand, such forced inflation often leads to some form of backlash. We all know the story of the first settlement in Zayer Vadi. It had easy access to coal, which other colonies needed to keep the cold weather at bay, but instead of exchanging said coal for a reasonable amount of different goods, the Veilmen increased its price so high, they suddenly found themselves without trading partners, and all died of starvation while sitting on the mountain of now useless fuel. So, to sum it up, lack of any oversight, that is one of the main traits of barter system, can lead to even more problems than fluctuating currency. Still, the barter system was removed within the first half century in Ortus, but since then our governments, first national ones then the OCN, made seemingly no efforts to improve our financial stability. The Exile Party reverted to the ways of old Earth and reintroduced a form of regulated, industry-based capitalism, which, while useful on Earth, had no infrastructure to sustain itself. Then the Innovation Party came into power, and while many of us had hoped they would, among other things, innovate our financial system, it turned out out, we were mistaken. The economical matters were overlooked, and even worse, the party spent the amassed money seemingly without a care, failing to realize that we are simply unable to sustain a state that encompasses other planets and star systems, which led us to the crisis we face today. A crisis we will now present a solution for. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to present SFS newest form of payment, an energy credit, a cross between a material currency and barter system, a financial instrument of unprecedented stability and, unless someone figures out a way to extinguish the stars themselves, immune to all forms of inflation and speculation. The idea behind this form of currency is deceptively simple. The value of energy credits is everything. 
Look at it from the scientific point of view. Everything around you, your fellow guests, the chairs, the drinks, the room, is, when broken down to its most basic components, stellar energy transformed in one way or another into matter. Even more abstract things can be viewed in this way. Your thoughts, for instance, are nothing but electric impulses inside your brains. And what are those impulses if not energy? As such, it is the only universally produced and consumed resource that surrounds us, literally, in every single moment of our lives. It is necessary to all production processes and we already monitor its acquisition and spending in painstaking detail. And with recent advances in technology, we already have infrastructure we need in order to switch to energy credits practically overnight. That way, we'll be able to retain the policies of free market and regulated capitalism our ancestors invented, but without all the problems that come with them. All that remains is to decide on the value of individual credit. Personally, I would propose some of the most basic consumable good that can be purchased. A food cartridge, which is enough to sustain a grown man for a day. But that decision will, ultimately, have to be made together with the government. For now, all I need to know is your opinions of this idea. So, without further ado, let us get right down to voting. Who supports the energy credits as the main form of currency? Who is against? Who abstains? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think you have made a wise choice today. Once the panel is over, I will present our proposition to the Council. But for now, on behalf of entire Sinon Financial Solutions, I'd like to once again thank you for your support. It is possible that today we have not only saved our nation from going broke, but we've also secured our stability for ages to come. May we all prosper among the stars. A few months later, our theory that our science ships will help us solve the crisis was confirmed, as Commander Giraud reported that her crew has made some very promising discovery on Antarctic planet of Redamon 2. Not only was the planet deemed a very good spot for the next potential colony, but also the native bacterial life forms that lived on the surface displayed a very peculiar trait. They were able to connect with each other to form a sort of a solar cell, one that was slightly more efficient than the ones we used. That discovery immediately catched the attention of a number of people, but very quickly the discussion dissolved into two options. Admiral Lin, supported by Professor Lachinov, argued that the bacterial blankets could be used to improve the deflector shields of our ships. Basically, instead of absorbing sunlight, the bacteria would absorb incoming fire, and thus help mitigate the damage. But on the other hand, the Industrious Council, backed by Dr. Poniewski, claimed that these microbes could very well be used in our transition to energy-based currency. Not to mention, they would simply help with our interstellar energy grid. In the end, the civilian option prevailed, and soon we began constructing brand new solar cells that slightly increased our global energy output. Not much in current terms, but once we truly begin our expansion, this technology will surely provide us with tons of additional energy. In the meantime, Commander Ku and CSV Tesla continued their exploration efforts further away from our borders. Their next target was a very large Dewix system, and as soon as they arrived, they immediately went on with the standard procedure – go to the nearest planet and look for something interesting. However, once Tesla's long-range sensors finished their scan, the regular procedure was immediately ignored, since the scanners showed yet another habitable planet in the system. Dewix 3 was, according to the preliminary data, a rather warm planet, mostly covered in shallow oceans. But, unlike other planets we found, this one was extremely lush and green, with rich biosphere and dense mangrove-like jungles that covered every stretch of land and extended for hundreds of kilometers into the sea. For people of old Earth, planet like this would have been a paradise, but to us it might prove a little bit of a challenge, since we are not used to worlds with such high amount of liquid water and so little land. Still, as with that Mesa planet we discovered earlier, Dewix 3 will surely be a great source of water, not to mention the jungles which will surely provide us with tons of wood, which is very rare on Ortus and Curaçao. And while it surely will be unpleasant for the first pioneers, colonizing Dewix 3 might just be the experience we need in order to combat our poor adaptability. Plus, we could build cities on the ocean, and those are always nice. Soon, we got even more good news. While scanning a scorching hot molten lava planet of Redamon 1, the crew of CSV Outlier found out something they haven't expected. Gold. The magma on the surface of the world was extremely rich in molten gold, which immediately prompted a response from the crew of CSV Developer, our construction vessel, and its crew, keeping their frontier spirit, immediately grabbed their hard hats, yelled, there's gold in them there volcanoes, and went to work to establish an orbital mining base out there. And while it may not seem like much, 
much, considering we're switching from regular currency to energy-based one, this gold rush will still be extremely useful, because gold actually has tons of uses, far more interesting than just being a shiny base material for jewellery. For one, it is an extremely dependable electrical conductor. Minerals like, say, copper or silver are still better, but gold is far more reliable because it's almost completely immune to corrosion, which means that almost every electronic device is made using a bit of it. And then, most importantly, gold has tons of uses in space. For example, in order to reflect the infrared radiation of the stars, most of our ships and stations are outfitted with polyester gold-coated film that reflects said radiation, which, in turn, means that our people won't boil inside of their craft. And also, in zero-g environments, gold serves as a lubricant for various mechanical components. Basically, you just need a thin layer of it between some moving parts, as gold molecules will simply slip past one another and dissipate the friction. So, even though we're not the four-clad trappers of old, this gold rush may still be really profitable to our people. So time to grab a flame-resistant pickaxe and start digging. But even lure of gold can't distract our people from politics for too long, and just as CSV developer departed to build our interstellar gold mine, we received news about new political faction. On the first day of year 2211, a committee of technocratic reform was established, and Professor Tanwa, still busy with her amazing project, was elected as its leader. Now, this party's interests are once again mostly in line with what we already do. They're happy about our exploration efforts and appreciate that the state doesn't meddle in research to much, but, to OCN's surprise, they also expect us to establish research agreements with other factions. I have no idea what other factions they have in mind, maybe they just want to establish some better cooperation with Kurosao, or maybe they know something we don't. Regardless, until we figure out just what the hell they have in mind, they won't really contribute anything to our politics. They will just be there, sitting in the parliament. Hopefully it won't distract them from their duties too much. Anomaly detected. And back to the frontier again, this time to deal with news from Commander Kuo. Apparently, he and his men have found a very odd mountain on the molten surface of Duix-1. For a moment there, OCN leadership thought this was a joke. Our most experienced explorers are obsessing over some mountain, but the early scans from the starship Tesla proved to the Council that this excitement was well deserved, and they gave a green light to proceed, especially since, up to this point, Duix's system proved to be one of the more interesting ones we explored so far. But as we were waiting for a more more detailed report, we received another message from the Council. Yet another party was formed called Xeno Friendship Watch, and it was led by none other, to surprise of almost everyone except her closest friends, than Admiral Shu Lin. She gathered around herself all those alien enthusiasts who still believe we're on the verge of finding intelligent life in the universe, and as it turned out, there were so many of them that Ocean had to recognize them as a political force, albeit a slightly odd one. Because, you see, this Xenoist party is a theoretical party. Sure, they do exist, but their ideas are so far impossible to implement. Still, it's nice to see such optimism among our people, and who can tell? Maybe one day we'll need a faction like this one. Time will tell. But we're apparently still not done with political shenanigans, as soon we're treated to yet another message about yet another faction showing up in the Council. This time, it's the Individual Choice Foundation, an egalitarian group whose honorary leader is our first and most renowned explorer, Commander Shen Kuo himself. I guess he makes a good face for this party, since, being so far away from our borders, he actually has all the individual choice he wants. Still, his faction is relatively similar to the Industrial Council, but less focused on workers and industry and more on economical and personal freedoms, which means they also support our current government. But unfortunately, all those parties suddenly showing up in the Council have greatly divided the attention of our people, and that translates to slightly lower influence we have over our citizens. Still, having some influence is better than having none, so we'll take it. At the very least, it's good to know that our people are conscious enough to make informed choices when it comes to backing up a political party. But for now, the politics will have to step aside, because today, on the 1st of April 2211, 
humanity's first colony on a different planet has officially reached a number of 1 billion citizens, which means it's no longer considered a frontier world, but a self-sufficient planet with the same rights and laws as Ortus. Now, this billion citizens is a completely arbitrary value, of course. The colony was deemed self-sustaining several months ago, but it's always nice to have a nice round number to go with your official celebration. Basically, what this means is that all the groundwork has been done on Curacao. The infrastructure has been established and the planetary society can now grow on its own without constant support from home. And that, as you might expect, means that our financial crisis is over, and just in time because we almost run out of money there. But since we're finally in the green, we can immediately begin to expand our presence on Curacao. See, though the planet is technically able to sustain itself, there is still one crucial resource that needs to be imported from Ortus – food. In theory, we have a global surplus of food, which means that lack of agriculture and Curacao isn't too much of a problem, but it's always better to be prepared for potential troubles before they happen. So, we're going to start building hydroponic farms in the valley northwest of Port Prosperity. And now, remember that weird mountain range that excited our explorers? Here's the shocker. It's not a mountain range, it's a skeleton. A massive, gigantic skeleton of something that we can barely even imagine existing. It's going to require a huge investment of time and resources to really research it, but for now we'll put that project on hold. The skeleton isn't going anywhere, so CSV Tesla can finish the sweep of the system first before contributing to this time-consuming project. Unless, of course, the skeleton will go somewhere, but in that case we will probably abandon this system altogether. And another anomaly, there's a second black hole within range of our wormholes, and just like the previous one, it's a perfect place to do some stress tests for our hardware, and to think that just a few years ago the very existence of black holes was still disputed. We came far in these past years, but nowhere is our technological ascendancy more evident than in the latest project of our Biosog division. With everything we've learned about living organisms, and with all the secrets of the brain we discovered, Professor Tanwa and her team showed the leaders of OCN something groundbreaking. Using our knowledge, we could take a race of beings like Kithri and uplift them, a term which means improving their biology and their brains to match our level of intelligence, bypassing tens or even hundreds of thousands of years of natural evolution. Evolution. Of course, we can't do this to just any species, we specifically need the pre-sentient ones, since their brains are already complex enough for all the patterns we need to implant into them. So basically, this knowledge is only applicable to Kithri right now, but it doesn't change the fact that this is big. Extremely big. So far, we haven't encountered truly intelligent life in the universe, but now with everything we know, we can get the metaphorical apes off their trees, put them in suits, and create our own intelligent life. As was mentioned, what was once like magic, today is in the realm of possibility. Very costly and time-consuming possibility, but that doesn't matter. We're going to do it anyway, no matter the cost, simply because we can. And sure, there will be those who will complain, who will say that we're playing gods, but we're going to ignore them. For the first time, humanity has the power not to just destroy life, but to create it. And create it we will, even if that means putting many of our other projects on hold. Sure, the government could probably stop it, but the council is renowned for its pragmatism. If the uplift project succeeds, it means more citizens. More citizens means more workers and more taxes. Who cares if they're paid by walking mushrooms? What's not to like? But as it stands, the destruction of life is still the main theme of the stars around us. In a bizarre twist of fate, the explorers from Tesla have found a walking alien weapon, frozen in the ice of Duix 7A, a weapon that was strangely similar to the laser beams used by our military, except slightly more efficient. Perhaps this laser cannon was used to bring down the being that turned into that gigantic skeleton. Perhaps it was placed there for some unknown purpose. We'll never know, we can't even figure out how old this weapon is, but it doesn't matter. Matter. The design is so similar to ours that we can simply send the schematics back home and begin mass production right away, which actually was the first time our government took a really serious look at the design of our military ships. Up until now, they were mostly out there to scare the would-be pirates away, since no civilian vessel could stand up to them, but now, as we explore further and further, OCN leadership decided that it would be a good idea to make our corvettes competitive. After all, we still have that void cloud in the clue system close to home, and it might be smart to take it out before it does something unexpected. So the upgrades were commenced. 
first, the outer loader device was removed from our corvettes. In theory, it increased the fire rate of our vessels, but in practice the boost was so minuscule and the energy drain so high that it was deemed useless and ultimately scrapped. Then, armor was added. Earlier models of Acula relied mostly on energy deflectors, but now, with newly developed Ceramo metal armor, one of the shield generators was removed in order to reduce ship's mass enough to outfit it with armor plating. And finally, the new blue lasers were installed, increasing the overall firepower. And here's why those energy weapons are so useful. Without the outer loader, our corvettes now had excess power, and that excess power can be used to increase the output of our lasers, increasing damage potential even more. So now, Akulas are ready, all we have to do is to find them a suitable target. But that will have to wait. Everything will have to wait, because now the attention of our government is fixed on Commander Kuo. On the most secure frequency, reserved for the most critical, top-secret data, he has sent the following message. Distress signal received. Source is apparently a derelict ship orbiting Duix 5A. Moving to investigate. If possible, send Admiral Lin with her ships, but tell her to keep her distance. We have no idea what we're dealing with here. Then, a few days later, another message, this time marked with never-before-used X symbol, shook Ocean leaders to their very core. We found the source of the signal. It really comes from a wrecked ship of unknown origin. However, upon closer examination, we learned that the ship, which we initially thought to be destroyed, still has some life support. Scans pick up movement and life forms on board. I repeat, something is alive there. And apparently, it calls for help. Preparing to board right now. Wish us luck. We'll see you soon. How's the communication efforts coming along, Mr. Dahl? Any response? Negative. We've been bombarding this wreckage with tons of messages, both verbal and written ones, in all our official languages. We also tried all known wavelengths and frequencies, but still there's no response. Have you tried sending some pictures or videos? Picture writing should be universal, or at least easier to understand. Tried that as well, but nothing happened. Though, actually, every now and then we're getting pinged, like someone out there is trying to open up a channel to us, but it turns it off before establishing a connection. I see. Keep trying. Mr. Leonov, do your scans show us anything new? No, Commander. Still the same thing. Lots of tapping noises and erratic movement, all confined in that one section that still has some life support. Though, some of those moving signatures have stopped moving over the last hours, and remain still ever since. Wait a second, Leonov. We have a signal from the derelict. It's a text message, but it's just a handful of random symbols. Let me see. These are not random symbols, Mr. Dahl. There's a message here, sent by someone who clearly uses a different script than we do, but I think they understand us. By the stars, you're right. It says help. Commander, as much as I'm excited about meeting spacefaring aliens, I can't help but think this is a bad idea. You want us to enter an unknown wreck that has been severely damaged by unknown forces. What if those unknown forces are still inside there and this is a trap? Mr. Leonov report. How are those energy signatures reacting to our approach? One of them is moving towards the airlock, Commander, although every now and then it stops. The rest are still twitching, and another one stopped moving altogether. Does this look like a trap to you, Lieutenant Sheriff? Because to me, it looks like something bad has happened over there, and the crew, whoever or whatever they may be, is slowly dying while we're sitting here arguing about theories. So I appreciate your concern, Lieutenant, but I will not be second-guessed by my security chief again. If you're not willing to do your job, then step aside. I'll take point anyway. And full responsibility if something goes wrong. No need, Commander. I'm with you, and so is my team. I'm just trying to keep us safe. Good. So do your last checks, because we're about to dock. And keep your fingers off the triggers until I give the order, understood? We do not want this first contact to turn into bloodbath. Heldman, how's the approach? Almost there, Commander. Just need to... There. We've docked with the derelict. Equalizing pressure in the airlock right now. Got it. Mr. Leonov, how's that signature closest to us doing? It's in the airlock right now. Waiting for you, I hope, but I can't really tell. Once you open the hatch, it should be in full view right in front of you. That's promising. It's not trying to hide. All right. Pressure equalized. I'm moving to open the airlock. Hands off your triggers and keep those flashlights low. We do not want to blind... whatever that is. All right. On three. One... Two, three. By the... Hold your fire, man, hold your fire! What the hell is this thing? Stars. So that's what was making that clacking noise. Those claws could go right through... All right, Shen, focus. Welcome, friend. My name is Shen Kuo of CSV Tesla. Me and my crew come in peace... What the hell? I told you to hold your fire! We are! 
It just collapsed on its own. Look there, at the side of its head. I don't know what this purple ooze is, but I think it's injured. Look, there's something moving in the wound. Some sort of... warm? You're right. Okay, now that's not how I expected the first contact with aliens to go. Close the hatch, we'll focus on this one first. This is Commander Kuwatu Medbay. We have one patient for you, but you'll have to get your tools and come to the airlock because I have no idea if our air won't kill it. And let me be honest here, Doc, if you'll manage to patch this one up, they should name the next colony after you.